ان الحمد لله نحمده ونستعينه ونستغفره ونعوذ بالله من شرور انفسنا ومن سيئات اعمالنا من يهده الله فلا مضل له ومن يضلل فلا هادي له واشهد ان لا اله الا الله وحده لا شريك له واشهد ان محمدا عبده ورسوله صلى الله وسلم وبارك عليه وعلى اله وصحبه وسلم تسليما كثيرا اما بعد فان اصدق الحديث كتاب الله تعالى وخير الهدى هدى محمد صلى الله عليه وسلم وشر الامور محدثاتها وكل محدثه بدعه وكل بدعه ضلاله وكل ضلاله في النار as muslims one of the things that we realize is that allah subhanahu wa ta'ala throughout the quran has given us guidelines and some of them like as you get guidelines in other places as well some of them are long and detailed and some of them are very short and snappy easy to remember so normally like when you have a movie trailer for example or you have like a movie poster they have the title of the movie and then they always have a line underneath right like the terminator is back or something like that just to just to something that you can remember like a slogan that you can remember very easily and so it's something which sticks in your mind allah subhanahu wa ta'ala throughout the quran has given us certain surahs certain verses that are like these slogans that we keep within our minds and they're there to anchor us to remind us of something so that when we lose our way and we don't always remember our purpose in this life those slogans those verses those surahs of the quran will anchor us back so one of those verses of the quran from a surah that we recite over 17 times a day within our prayers surah al-fatiha the most renowned most famous surah of the quran known as umm al-quran the mother of the quran and the arabs call something mother because of its importance because your mother is probably the most important person in your life and so the mother of the quran is the most important surah of the quran and that is surah al-fatiha now within that surah that we recite 17 odd times a day is a verse in which allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says ihdinas sirat al-mustaqim o oh allah guide us to the straight path now the straight path has a number of attributes not just that it's straight but it has a number of attributes and from those attributes is that it is a balanced way part of something being straight is that it is balanced and so allah subhanahu wa ta'ala within surah al-fatiha a surah that we recite over 17 times every single day as muslims Allah is reminding us of the importance of balance. You can't just go to one extreme or the other. In Islam we don't have the concept of monks. It is not allowed for a person to go and close themselves off in a masjid and just live there and pray 24/7. Never leaving, never going out. Just worship after worship after worship. It's not a concept in our religion. And that's why Umar radiyallahu an during his khilafa if he came into the masjid and saw young men sitting during the day in the masjid in masjid an nabawi he would take his stick and he would beat them out kick them out with his stick and he would say we're not monks in this religion go and work you wouldn't let them just sit there idly doing nothing and so we have balance in our religion and so that balance is between religion and life deen and dunya and the rights and responsibilities that you have now during the time of the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam and you can imagine that during that time they went through a lot of oppression a lot of transgression a lot of difficulty and hardship yet even so the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam would always emphasize to them balance there is a famous hadith in sunan at-tirmidhi of a famous man from amongst the companions known as hanzala radiyallahu an hanzala one day was walking in the streets of medina and he passed by abu bakr radiyallahu an and abu bakr radiyallahu an saw on his face that he was perturbed that's that he was disturbed that something was wrong 
And so he said to him, what's wrong, O Hanzala? And he replied, Nafaqa Hanzala. Hanzala has committed hypocrisy. Imagine a companion of the Prophet ﷺ accusing himself of hypocrisy. So Abu Bakr asked, why? Why have you committed hypocrisy? And he replied, because when we sit with the Prophet ﷺ, our iman is so high. We're so engrossed in the company of the Prophet ﷺ that we're just on a spiritual high. But when we leave him and we go back to our families, our houses, our children, our businesses, our jobs, that high goes down to a low. So I feel like I'm committing hypocrisy. And so Abu Bakr radiallahu an, who was the most knowledgeable of the companions, he said, you know what? You're right. What you're saying, oh, alhamdulillah, is right. Let us go to the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wasallam and ask him about this. So they both went to the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wasallam. And the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wasallam asked, Hanzala, what's wrong? And he said, O oh, Messenger of Allah, I've committed hypocrisy. He said, why? He said, because when I sit with you, I feel in such a spiritual high. But when I leave you to go to my family and my children and my house, my business and my job, then I feel like I don't have any iman. So this is hypocrisy. And so the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wasallam looked at him and he said, O oh, Hanzala, if you were always in the way that you are with me, if your iman was always so high, if you were constantly in that way that you are with me, then the angels from the heavens would descend them themselves and they would come and shake your hands in your houses and in your roads. They themselves would come and greet you. وَلَكِنْ يَا حَمْضَلَ سَاعَةٌ وَسَاعَةٌ But O Hanzala, there is a time for this and there is a time for that. And this, my dear brothers and sisters, is the essence of our religion. We are not angels. We're not perfect. We're not infallible from sin. We're not created just so that we worship Allah 24-7 and don't do anything else. We need food. We need drink. We need rest. We need company. We need entertainment sometimes as well in a halal way. So the Prophet ﷺ says to him, Sa'atun wa sa'a. There is a time for this and a time for that. Now some of the companions of the Prophet ﷺ, because they loved him so dearly, because they saw his example and they sought to follow his example, they wanted to be better than him in his worship. And so they asked his wife or some of his wives, how does the Prophet ﷺ pray? How does he fast? How does he worship Allah? And then they thought to themselves that he's the messenger of Allah. Allah's forgiven him for everything. All his past sins, all his future sins, he is infallible. As for us, then we are just weak humans. We sin and disobey Allah day and night. So we need to worship Allah more than he does. So one of them took an oath that they would pray the whole of the night and never sleep. And the second one took an oath that he would fast every day, he would never break his fast. And the third one took an oath that he would never ever get married. Simply dedicate themselves to the worship of Allah. And so when the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wasallam heard this, he said to them, Wallahi, inni atqaakum lillah. By Allah, I am the one who fears Allah most from amongst you. And I sleep and I pray. I fast and I break my fast and I marry. فَمَنْ رَغِبَ عَنْ سُنَّتِي فَلَيْسَ مِنِّي And whosoever leaves off my sunnah, he is not from me. Look at how the Prophet ﷺ is teaching them balance. During the life of the Prophet ﷺ, especially at Eid time, they would have people fighting in the masjid, wrestling in the masjid on the day of Eid. Imagine now if you were to go to a masjid and people were wrestling in that masjid, the whole community would stand and everyone would shout and everyone would ridicule those people. But during his time, the Prophet ﷺ allowed such things.
The Prophet ﷺ himself played sport. He wrestled. A man came to him and he wanted to wrestle him. And so the Prophet ﷺ wrestled him three times and he beat him three times. And the Prophet ﷺ would race with his wife Aisha radiallahu anha. And sometimes she would win and sometimes he would win. How many of us that are married have ever raced with our wives? Have ever played with our wives? However, have ever had a sport with our wives? Yet the Prophet ﷺ struck that balance. He would joke with his companions, he would laugh at them. The companions would say that he would sometimes come out of his house ﷺ, and he would listen to us talking about jahiliyyah about the days before Islam, what we used to do, the things we used to get up to. Just as sometimes when you meet your friends, you reminisce. You talk about your old days, nostalgia, the olden times. And the Prophet ﷺ would sit there, he would listen, and he would smile and laugh with his companions. Sa'atun wa sa'a. There is a time for this, there is a time for that. Abu Dhar radiallahu Abu Darda radiallahu an one of the famous companions of the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam he had a very close friend by the name of Salman al-Farisi and Salman al-Farisi came to visit him in his house and he found that he was absent he was out but he found his wife his wife was at home and so he entered upon her and this was before the verses of Hijr Jabu revealed before there was segregation in Islam and so he entered and he sat with her and he saw that she was wearing very very ill-fitting clothes clothes that are very shabby and so he said to her why are you dressed so badly and she replied because your brother meaning Abu Darda your brother has no need of women doesn't need me doesn't even look at me and so then when Abu Darda came home and he sat with Salman al-Farisi, he bought some food out. And so Salman said to him, why don't you eat? Eat with me, you're my host, eat with me. And he replied, no, I'm fasting. So Salman said, by Allah, I will not eat until you eat. So he made him break his fast and eat with him. And then when they went to sleep in the night, he was staying the night over. As they went to sleep, he found that he stood up, Abu Darda stood up to go and pray so he said to him no go back to sleep so he slept and then after a short while he stood up to go and pray and he said to him no go back to sleep and again he stood up to pray he said no go back to sleep and then towards the end of the night Salman al farisi stood up himself and he said now we go and pray and then in the morning he gave him an amazing lesson he said inna li rabbika alayka haqqa وَلِأَهْلِكَ عَلَيْكَ حَقَّا وَلِنَفْسِكَ عَلَيْكَ حَقَّا فَأَعْطِ كُلَّ ذِي حَقٍ حَقَّا Oh Abu Darda, indeed your Lord has a right over you and your family has a right over you and your own body has a right over you. So give to each one of them their due right. So Abu Darda, hearing this from Salman al-Farisi, he went to the Prophet sallallahu alayhi and he said, O oh, Messenger of Allah, this is what Salman said. What do you think? And the Prophet said, Sadaqa Salman. Salman has spoken true. What Salman is saying is correct. Yes, Allah has a right upon you. You need to worship Allah, pray five times a day, give your zakah, fast in the month of Ramadan, make hajj once in a lifetime, worship Allah. But your family also has a right over you so you need to work and earn a living and provide an education for your children and your own body has a right over you you need to rest sometimes you need to chill out sometimes you need a change of scenery so you need to give to each one their due right and that's why some of the companions radiallahu anhum they would sit down and they would relax and they would say we only do this so that inshallah when we go to worship Allah we will be stronger in that worship. As humans, we need balance. We need to strike that balance.
And this is something which the companions radiallahu anhum did even after the death of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Abu Bakr radiallahu anhu, when he first became the Khalifa of the Muslims, shortly after the death of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, and you can imagine how difficult a time that was. The Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam has just passed away. Not only that, but the Romans and the Persians are now attacking the Muslim lands. Not only that, but now there are false prophets, people who are claiming to be prophets of Allah after the death of our Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Not only that, but now the Arab tribes are saying that we're not even going to pay zakat to Abu Bakr. We would only pay it to a prophet of Allah. Problem after problem, issue after issue, hardship after hardship. So one day Umar radiallahu an wakes up. In this new era of Islam, a new dawn has come in Islam. Abu Bakr is the Khalifa. The Prophet sallallahu alayhi wasallam is no more. There are problems that they need to deal with, issues that they need to solve. And so he wakes up, he goes out into the streets of Medina, and he comes across a woman. And he says to her, what's wrong? She says, I'm looking for the Khalifa, he's nowhere to be found. Imagine that he's just been made the Khalifa and no one can find him. Umar says, you didn't look properly. Let's go to his house. They go to his house, knock on the door. One of his children opens the door. Where's your father? We don't know. It's not home. But maybe if you go to his garden, his bustan, his garden, maybe he's there. So they go to the garden, but he's not there. Okay, let's go to the masjid. He's not there. He's nowhere to be found. Can you imagine that a khalifa at this vital, pivotal time is nowhere to be found at the very beginning of his rulership, of his khilafa? And so eventually they find him. Do you know where they find him? They find him in the souq, in the marketplace, in the shopping mall. And what's he doing? Is he buying and selling? Or is he ordering the good and forbidding the evil? What's he doing? He's there earning a living. He's there, he was a businessman, and he's there selling his products, gaining some money. Umar radiallahu anh, and everyone here knows the nature of Umar. Right? Umar is not one of those nice guys that goes and reasons with the person. This is Umar. He says to Abu Bakr, oh Abu Bakr, what are you doing? Abu Bakr says, you can see what I'm doing. Right? I'm here. You can tell what I'm doing. He says, oh Abu Bakr, there are problems. People have come seeking out the Khalifa. He's nowhere to be found. And you're here earning a living. So Abu Bakr said, oh Umar, how will I feed myself and my family? Look at this amazing sense of prioritization. Look at the way the companions of the Prophet ﷺ struck that balance. This is Abu Bakr, the best of the companions, the best of this ummah after the Prophet ﷺ. Now if that was someone in our time, if you found the local imam of the masjid, he's out and he's got his own business, and he's trying to earn some more money, the whole of the community will probably jump him. Why on earth is he outside? Why on earth is he trying to earn a living? He should be in the masjid. He should be doing this and that and this. Then Abu Bakr says, I need to earn a living. So what does Umar radiallahu anhu say to him? He says, oh Abu Bakr, come back, deal with the problems of the Muslims, and we will give you a wage. From the treasury, from the Baytul Mal, we will pay your wage. And so he agrees. And he leaves and he goes back to the issues of the people. A few days pass, Umar radiallahu an comes out again. He finds some people, he asks them what's wrong. They say the Khalifa is nowhere to be found. He's nowhere to be found. They go to his house, they go to his garden, they go to the masjid, he's not there. So Umar radiallahu an thinks, I think I know where he is. So they go back to the souq, to the marketplace, and they find Abu Bakr. And what's Abu Bakr doing radiallahu an? Abu Bakr is there, selling again. He's back to his business. Umar radiallahu an says, Oh Abu Bakr, what are you doing? He says, I'm here selling. He says, we gave, gave you a wage so that you wouldn't have to do this. Abu Bakr says, it's not enough for me and my family. What you gave is not sufficient for me and my family. I still need to work. 
So Abu Bakr radiallahu an has enough self-dignity. He's not going to go groveling and begging from the Muslims to increase his wage. He can go and work. So he goes to work. So Umar radiallahu an says, Oh Abu Bakr, come back. We'll give you an increase in your wage. We'll give you more money. So then Abu Bakr agrees and he leaves the marketplace. Look at how the companions of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wasallam, even during the most pivotal of times, the most vital of times, the most pressing of times, they still struck that balance. They would still laugh. They would still have a good time sometimes. They would still have that balance between family and worship and dunya and so on and so forth. They knew how to strike that balance. Abu Bakr radiallahu an, during his time as a Khalifa, he would do so many good deeds that the other companions when they found out, they would say that whoever succeeds Abu Bakr radiallahu an, will never be able to live up to his standard. Why? Because even though there was so much going on in the ummah, he would never neglect himself. Never neglect himself. Never neglect his own worship of Allah. Never neglect his family. Never neglect his own body. He would have a balance between these things. And so this, my dear brothers and sisters, is what our religion teaches us. What our religion teaches us. And that's why you find that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala within the religion has facilitated all of this for you. Everything is facilitated for you within the Sharia. You don't need to go anywhere else. You don't need to look for this anywhere else. It's already there within the Sharia. The Sharia facilitates ease. The Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam would say to the people, Bashiru wa la tunafiru, yassiru wa la tu'asiru. Make things easy, don't make them hard. Give people good tidings, don't turn them away. Don't push them away. And that's why even in worship of Allah, there is a balance. Even in worshiping Allah, there is a balance. When Mu'adh ibn Jabal radiallahu an would lead the people in prayer, and he would make his prayer so long, worshiping Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, and Mu'adh is making his prayer long to show off, or to get the praise of others. He's doing it to please Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. But behind him are the elderly and people who are ill and people who need to go to work and people who have other commitments and other needs and responsibilities. And so they went to the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam complaining about Mu'adh. O Messenger of Allah, Mu'adh leads the prayer and he makes it so long. Now there's nothing wrong with a long prayer. The Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam himself at times would read in a single raka'ah Surah Al-Baqarah. He would prolong the prayer, but not when those people were behind him, when he was praying alone, or when it was a voluntary prayer. So he said to Mu'adh radiallahu an, O oh Mu'adh, inna minkum munafireen. Amongst the group of people, the companions, there are those who turn other people away from worshipping Allah who turn other people away from obeying Allah. They prolong the prayer and they don't know that behind them are the weak and the elderly and the sick and those people who have responsibilities that they need to go and take care of. So be gentle with the people. Be easy with the people. And so the Prophet ﷺ, even in worship, he struck that balance. And this is why one of the most common questions that we get as Imams, is what is the ruling of PlayStation? Right? And I got this question here last year. I don't know if you guys remember. What is the ruling of the PlayStation? What is the ruling of Facebook? What is the ruling of Twitter? What is the ruling of TV? What is the ruling of a computer and so on and so forth? What are the rulings of these things? And really the answer to this is very simple. Because the answer to that is like the answer to the question, what is the ruling of this pen? What is the ruling of this pen? Who can answer this question? What is the Islamic ruling of this pen? Not literally this pen, a pen. Right? This is a British pen, but still, what is the ruling of a pen? Who can give me an answer? No one? Okay, who says halal? Let me make it easier for you. Who says haram? And the rest of you don't use pens. Okay. okay. 
The answer is, it's not about the pen. It's not about the PlayStation. It's not about the TV. It's not about Facebook or Twitter. The answer is, it's about the user. It's about me and you. Because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, within our religion, He hasn't mentioned detailed rulings for every single thing that we will ever come into contact with in our lives. You can't go to the Sharia, you can't go to the Quran or the Sunnah and find a ruling of a pen, or the ruling of a chair, or the ruling of a glass, or the ruling of a car. This can't be done. The answer to this is it's about the user. Now if I was to take this pen, and I was to write a book calling others to Islam, or write a book, for example, explaining how to pray, or write a book about the tafsir of Surah Fatiha, what's the ruling of this pen now? What's the ruling of this pen? Not only is it halal, yes it's halal, but it's more than halal now. What's the ruling? It is an act of worship. This pen is an act of worship. Because when you call others to Allah, what is that? It's a good deed, right? You're worshipping Allah by calling others to Allah. So now this pen is an act of worship. If I was to take this pen and just write my name, what's the ruling? What's the ruling? Is it a good deed to write Ahsan Hanif? No? So what's the ruling? It's halal. There's nothing wrong with writing my name. Right? But if I was to take this pen and forge a bank account, or forge a false identity, now what's the ruling of this pen? It's haram. Right? So the problem isn't the pen, nor is the problem the PlayStation, nor is the problem the TV, nor is the problem your laptop, your iPad, your computer. The problem is me and you. Because we don't know how to strike that balance. Yes, you can go and have a good time. Yes, you can laugh and joke. But there are certain guidelines that you need to know as well. And so that's what I really want to go through in the last few minutes that I have before you. Number one, the first and most important guideline is that you must always remember your true purpose and goal. What is your vision in this life? What do you wish to attain from the dunya? And we all know that our purpose in life is to, to worship Allah. Our goal in life is to attain the pleasure of Allah. Our vision in life is to enter into Jannah and Yawmul Qiyamah by the permission of Allah. That is our goal, that is our vision. So when we have that as our goal and our vision, then now that balance will come and we will strike that balance. Because we know what we're here for. So when someone comes and they want you to listen to music, or they want you to watch something which is haram, then you will say no. Why? Because even though it's easy to do, you know that your vision is the pleasure of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Yes, you want to strike a balance, but that balance has to also please Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And that's why the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam was asked by his companions, O Messenger of Allah, you joke with us, you laugh with us, you play pranks on us. And he would say, yes, but I never lie in my jokes. Yes, I have a good time, I joke, but there is a limit. There is a boundary that I don't transgress. I never lie in my jokes. And so that balance is struck when you know that your vision is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Number two is always take the middle path. Always take the middle path. Never go to one extreme or the other. For example, you have money. You got a lot of money. Money is halal. There's nothing wrong with money. To spend that money is halal as well. However, there are certain things which will lead you to one extreme or another. In Islam, it is not recommended, it is disliked, it is frowned upon for you to be stingy and miserly. Some people, they have a lot of money, but they won't even spend it upon their own children. They won't even fix their own house. They won't even fix their own car. What do they do? They hoard that money. That's one extreme. The other extreme is someone who spends it on everything and anything. Halal and haram. Everything. They're just a spendthrift. They just waste their money. Those are two extremes. What do you do? You take the middle path. 
You spend on yourself, you spend on your family, you worship Allah through your money by giving charity, you strike a balance between all of these components. As Allah Azza wa Jal says in the Quran, وَابْتَغِ فِي مَا آتَاكَ اللَّهُ الدَّارَ الْآخِرَةِ وَلَا تَنْسَ نَصِيبَكَ مِنَ الدُّنْيَا That which Allah has given you, seek with that the pleasure of Allah. But don't forget your portion in this life. Don't forget your portion in this life. And that's why the Prophet ﷺ never allowed for his companions to give all of their wealth away in charity. With the exception of one person. Who was that one person? Abu Bakr radiallahu anhu. Because Abu Bakr, his iman was so high and so strong that he could give all of his money away. And it wouldn't be a problem for him. For everyone else, Umar only gave half away. Others, he would say that if you want to give, only give a third. You can't give more than a third. Striking that balance. And so the Prophet ﷺ always taught us to strike that balance. Number three is use the power of your intention. And inshallah, I will conclude with this point. Use the power of your intention. Your intention is in your heart. And with the power of that intention, every single living second that you spend upon this earth can be an act of worship. You can turn it into a good deed. You can turn it in a way that it will bring you closer to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Every single second, whether you're sleeping, whether you're awake, whether in your job, whether you're with your family, whether you're playing with your children, whether you're laughing with your friends, all of that can be an act of worship. How? By using the power of intention. What is the power of intention? One of the biggest misconceptions that we have about intention, about our niya, is that we think that it's only restricted to acts of worship. If you want to pray, you have niya. If you want to go for hajj, you have niya. If you want to sacrifice, you have niya. But that's it, only in acts of worship. And this is wrong. In fact, intention can be used for every single thing. Just like I gave you the example of that pen. If your intention with that pen was to write something so that people will come closer to Allah, that is an act of worship. That writing is an act of worship. If you go to sleep at night and before you go to sleep, you have the intention that inshallah you will wake up for Salatul Fajr with more energy and more passion and more enthusiasm and you will be better able to worship Allah than for every second that you sleep, it is an act of worship. If when you go and eat and drink, when you have lunch or dinner or breakfast, if your intention is so that you will have more energy to worship Allah, to fulfill your responsibilities, to look after your spouse and your children, your parents, your siblings, every single morsel of food is an act of worship to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. If you go and you sit with your friends and you laugh and joke and you only do that which is halal, you don't break any of the laws of Allah and your intention is to, is to uh, enter happiness into their hearts. Your intention is to come closer to Allah by building those bonds of brotherhood and sisterhood. Then that is an act of worship to Allah. If your intention when you go and play a sport is to become stronger so that you can worship Allah better, so that you can have a bit of a respite, a bit of a rest, so that you can worship Allah better and fulfill your duties as a Muslim better, then that is an act of worship to Allah. All of your life can become an act of worship. If when you go to work, your intention is so that you can look after your wife or your husband and your children and your parents and you can give of sadaqah and zakah and with that money you can go and make hajj and umrah then every single keystroke on that keyboard every single second that you spend whether it's sitting or standing or whatever it is that you do all of that is an act of worship to Allah so my dear brothers and sisters Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is the most merciful the most kind the most generous there's not a bank of good deeds that Allah has that there's only a certain limit that he can give to you, otherwise he's going to go bankrupt. No. Allah Azza wa Jal has an unlimited revenue of good deeds. He has an unlimited reserve of good deeds. Allah can give to you as much as he pleases. You can make your whole life an act of worship to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So yes, as Muslims, we strike that balance between worshiping Allah, 
between looking after our families, between spending time with our friends, between looking after our own bodies, between resting and having a good time. But in all of those things, we only want to please Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And if that is your intention, that is your goal, then all of that is an act of worship. Even when you're chilling, you're worshiping Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. How great is that? What a beautiful religion. What a merciful Lord. What an amazing concept that your whole life is worshiping Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. However, it is only easy for those that Allah makes it easy for. It's easily said, but it's very difficult to implement. It requires determination, requires hard work, requires effort, requires dedication, requires high aspirations, and it will require training. And so my dear brothers and sisters, I want to leave you with this message. Train yourself from now. Every time you sit with your parents, every time you laugh with your friends, every time you go to work, every time you go and you have some food with someone. And obviously when you worship Allah, Train your intention to be for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and I guarantee you that it will transform your life. That you will not only change yourself, but you will change those around you as well. You will be an instrument for good. And Allah azza wa jal will use you for good as well. I ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that he gives us that ability and he grants us that blessing of using the power of, of that intention and ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that he grants us the ability to strike that balance. Jazakumullah khayran wa sallallahu wa sallam ala nabiya Muhammad wa ala alihi wa sahbihi ajma'in wa salamu alaykum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.